First of all, uh, uh, I'm David Feldman, and a very big welcome to the, uh, the public law conference, the, the inaugural public law conference, um, which is um, uh, sponsored by Hart Publishing and, and, and has been organised by a fantastic team, which is sitting over here, uh, John Bell, Mark Elliott, Jason Veruhas and, and Philip Murray. Um, and they have put together a, a programme of, of stellar speakers um, uh, with whom I have the pleasure of uh, conducting an opening conversation um, with one, um, Sir John Laws, Lord Justice Laws. Um, the uh, way that we want to, uh, to conduct this is uh, that, that we will chat, but that at some stage, we hope, um, you will, if you've not gone to sleep, um, find something to contribute. And when you do, please just come in. This is a conversation. It's not necessarily a, a two-way conversation. It, 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 so the more um, involvement from you there is, um, the, the, the more uh, entertaining it's likely to be. And uh, there are, I gather, roving microphones which will rove at, at the appropriate time. So we'll try to keep an eye open for, for anyone who wants to, to uh, contribute. Um, Sir John Laws is um, a, 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 a tremendous lawyer, a tremendous judge, and, and a wonderful person. He, he actually started out um, his education at the uh, Durham Cathedral Choir School, um, where he was followed, or his footsteps were followed in due course by one Tony Blair um, and um, uh, Rowan Atkinson. And you can <laughs> draw from that what you will. He went on to the Durham Cathedral School um, and, and I did, uh, when preparing for this, uh, you know, know your enemy, um, check the website of Durham Cathedral School, and I found under, um, uh, uh, under uh, former pupils a wonderful photograph on the front page of the website of uh, John Laws in a full bottom wig, which oh, just dear. goes to show that he hasn't changed very much over the last <laughs> 50 something years. Um, but he is the face of former pupils of, 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 of Durham uh, uh, Cathedral uh, School. And, uh, and, uh, and then he moved on from there to Exeter College, Oxford, um, where he studied literary humaniores, or, or greats, and um, he, he um, became an honorary fellow of Exeter College in 2000. Um, he had previously become an honorary fellow of uh, Robinson College, Cambridge in 1992. So we regard you as one of our own um, in, in, in every possible way. That feeling being um, accentuated by the excellent news that you ought to be the, um, the, the A.L. Goodhart visiting professor of legal science here in a couple of years' time. Mm. And, and we're looking forward to that hugely. Um, I'm not quite sure what will happen because I uh, read at the beginning of your ham lectures that um, law isn't a science, it's an art of a particular kind, but perhaps we can talk about that in a, in a minute as, as well. Um, uh, uh, John went on to the bar uh, and became in due course the, uh, the, the, the treasury devil, uh, the, the, the um, junior Treasury Council Common Law from um, 1984 to 92, um, and in that role and uh, as in others, he did a great deal to shape the development of uh, public law in this country o over an extended period. He went on to become a High Court judge in 1992 and a Lord Justice of Appeal um, in uh, 1998. Um, a, a, a position he still holds and has, has uh, held with distinction. And John has already 
made and continues to make many distinguished contributions to the academic literature as well as to the, the, the substance of the law. Um, most recently, in, in, in a Cambridge connection, he gave the David Williams annual lecture for 2012, the, the, the Good Constitution, which was published in the Cambridge Law Journal. And um, most recently of all, he has distilled a lifetime of thinking and, and, uh, and learning um, in this, the Hamlin lectures for, for this year, the Common Law Constitution, which is a fabulous read. And I, if, if you haven't bought it and read it, you must. I have to say this because it's a well-known um, uh, feature of, of Michael Parkinson-style sessions that the interviewee must have something to promote. And this is, <laughs> this is what John has to promote. It's a I, snip at 12.99 for the paperback. 12.99 for the paperback. <laughs> it's a shame it wasn't published by Hart and Chris Cooley, but uh. still. So, so, so that is that is it. But John has been and, and remains one of the the, the, the um, great thinking mans and thinking women's public lawyers. And, and, and so it's, it's great to have you here. Thank you well, for thank coming. Thank you. Um, we, we did discuss beforehand what uh, we might uh, talk about, and uh, John suggested discussing the challenge of human rights law, um, and, and I'm sure we will get there. Uh, what I'd, I'd like to, to start with, though, is, is with what's obviously your very deep love of the common law and the common law method, not just from a um, a sort of emotional point of view, but a, a sense that it has huge normative value. Um, and, and, and I wonder whether you'd like to lead us in with, by, by saying something about that. Well, I wish I could remember who it was that said, uh, in order to stay the same, it's necessary to change. Somebody said it. I, I thought for a long time that the genius and the good fortune of the common law is its uh, power of continuous self-correction. Um, we don't have uh, a codified constitution, of course. We don't have uh, a codified public law. We have individual statutes. And if you look at the long history of the common law, you will see that what we now call judicial review, uh, a potent weapon for the control of public power, it owes its origins to medieval writs which were issued to control lower courts and lower bodies. And the genius of the common law rests in part in the fact that this process has been continuous, uninterrupted, well, that's not quite right. It's interrupted from time to time, but it is continuous. And uh, in each generation, something is learned from what has gone before. So the judges of the common law, like me, can be extremely proud of their legal inheritance without uh, making the mistake of being proud of themselves. They are proud of a communal achievement uh, an achievement that uh, continues to flourish. It's been through bad times. Um, there was a time in the 50s, or David will remember better than me, perhaps the early 60s, when Lord Devlin said that the courts have lost the power to control the executive. Uh, uh, in the earlier part of the, of the 20th century, the... Uh, power of judicial review, wasn't called that then, was at a very low ebb. The growth of uh, uh, executive discretion had seemed to be unstoppable. Um, Lord Hewitt, who was a very bad chief justice, wrote a book in the 20s called The New Despotism, in which he was on to something. And it was about the growth of um, executive discretion. Then, from the 1960s, people began to remember the Wednesbury case, 1948, one King's Bench 223, decided over a weekend 
by Lord Green in 1948. And there were the seminal cases in the 60s, uh, Annis Minnick, Padfield uh, and, and others, which began to get rid of old metaphysics, like the distinction between uh, error within and without jurisdiction. And on that, there was built what we now call judicial review. So there's a modern history and an old history. And I think we should all be extremely grateful for it. Where, where, let's just take an example, one, one of the examples you've given, um, whichever, whichever you like. Um, so you, 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 in, in your, your lectures, you, you outlined uh, four features of common law method, um, the, the historical evolutionary approach, um, the ability to experiment through uh, decision making and then to um, review it uh, in, in, uh, and think again under the process of what I think you call distillation yeah. and, and, uh, and the, the, this link between the history, the creativeness, the um, uh, experimental uh, approach and, uh, and the distillation. Um, reaching a continuously moving stage of something like reflective equilibrium as, as things go along. Now, if you could take one of those cases and uh, tell us how those were working, maybe Annis Minnick or... You know, as, as, as well, the, the, the Annis Minnick case is a good example. It's decided in 1968. The a body called the Foreign Compensation Commission, you'll know all this, of course, the Foreign Compensation Commission had, had power to make certain orders or directions. And uh, there was a no certiorari clause, uh, a clause effectively or apparently forbidding review by the courts. There was an argument that a particular decision was not within the proper powers of the uh, FCC. And the House of Lords held, of course, that the uh, no certiorari clause was ineffective. They got round it. They got round it by what is a characteristic piece of common law genius. That is by treating as a matter of uh, construction or interpretation what is really a matter of substance. They held that the decision in question wasn't a decision and therefore not uh, um, uh, subject to the prohibition uh, that the uh, uh, statute had imposed. Now that uh, decision, though it involved, if you like, a piece of intellectual leger de main, has not really been, uh, well it certainly has not been challenged since and attempts to confine judicial review since then have either not been made or have faltered and failed. You may remember there was a time in the last government, I think when Lord Falconer was um, Lord Chancellor, uh, there was going to be a um, provision forbidding certiorari, forbidding judicial review in certain immigration decisions, and the outcry was um, uh, so great that the, the, the uh, provision was dropped. What is interesting though, and this shows the flexibility of what the common law can do, is that the, the, the law has allowed uh, controls, restrictions, procedural uh, confinements upon uh, the power of judicial review. You see this in the Planning Acts, in the uh, housing acts in acts about uh, transport where there's a statutory appeal against a decision by the minister to grant or withhold or to withhold planning permission uh, and it has to be brought within a tight timetable and so on. The law, the law respects that. The law does not apply an anisminic piece of reasoning to provisions of that kind and it's clear that what's behind all this is the notion that the, 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 there must be space for the law to say that some decision or another is out with the bounds of proper power. We'll allow the politicians to control much of the procedure, 
but not the substance, not the centre. Uh, and so th th that, I think, is the inheritance of the Alice Minnick case. Uh, at the same time, in uh, the 1960s, you had, what's it called, the Fairness Case, Ridge and Baldwin, about the chief police officer. That made the great breakthrough of holding that um, procedural fairness was not confined to judicial decision makers. And on that, we've built uh, the whole panoply of fairness as a, uh, a standard on which judicial review requires, and ultimately our modern law of legitimate expectation and so forth. So, Anis Minnick, um, Ridge and Baldwin are two cases which have given rise to the fruits that we have today in those particular ways. Would you regard those as distillations of what went before I, I, the, the, and exponents? I think a weakness of that analysis of mine, uh, which you would be too generous to point out, but which is nevertheless a real weakness, I think, is that these things, these four ideas run into each other so much that it's quite difficult to say that it's one or the other. It's, it, 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 it is a, uh, it's a process of refinement which we can reasonably call distillation. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you look at the, if, if, the, the, the march of time from 1968 when Anis Minnick was decided to, uh, until now, when we reach a position in which the Parliament has effectively given up the attempt to abolish judicial review. So I'll buy distill distillation, but acknowledge a weakness in the argument in the lectures. I, I, I wasn't dreaming of suggesting that there was a weakness in the argument. I was trying to work out something about what that means for the common law method in a public yeah. law setting. Um, can we ever know, if, if this is right, can we ever know what the, if you like, what the law is, what the law requires? Or are we in the position constantly of saying, oh, Anis Minnick, that was a jolly interesting um, experimental initiative. It seems by and large to have worked, except that in certain areas the um, legislature has pulled things back in a way that the courts haven't seen fit to challenge, and you mentioned the planning areas, for example. Mm. Um, and this is an example of what you call the balanced constitution, mm. that, that, that what, what we then are faced with, if we are public lawyers, is having to think both backwards and forwards about what the next experiment yes. can properly be. Um, because one might say, that what Anis Minnick is taken to mean, generally speaking, today is very different from what it was taken to mean in 1968 um, because of the way it's been played with by practitioners, judges, even academics yeah. over the intervening period. Well, th this is right, and, and, uh, but it is inevitable. Uh, you could say the same more broadly about the change in the use of what we now call judicial review from uh, early days when it was simply controlling lower courts to its present use as uh, a means of confining executive power. The, it, it does change and it changes sometimes uh, in ways that are uh, perhaps unexpected. And I think here there's another point to be made as prompted by David's question. We, we have a duty in the courts, I think, both to develop the law so as to ensure its uh, utility for today, but also to respect the virtue of legal certainty. And sometimes that is difficult. Uh, I, I think legal certainty is on the whole reasonably well served by the common law method because uh, it, it is uh, underpinned by the doctrine of stare decisis, by our rules of precedent, which are themselves quite refined. If you recall, the Supreme Court does not bind itself uh, and hasn't since the House of Lords practice direction of 1966, 
the Court of Appeal does bind itself. Uh, the Supreme Court, of course, binds the Court of Appeal and lower courts. The High Court does not bind itself, but uh, competing decisions of the High Court or the Divisional Court um, are rare because the practice is to, to follow an earlier such decision unless it's clearly wrong. So the, the doctrine of stare decisis, of precedent, is itself a refined doctrine. And it's refined because, at least this is the result, I couldn't claim it's the intention, it's refined because it produces a measured uh, approach to legal certainty. It gives some, but not too much, legal certainty. Maybe it could be better. Maybe it could be improved. But the answer to David's question is yes, there are these changes. Uh, and we, 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 we have to think very carefully if we're going to push the law into a uncharted direction. It can be done, and indeed there would be no common law at all if it was not done. But it's the, the beauty of the system is that that is possible but restrained. By the need for certainty. By, but, but, yes, and uh, by, by the long tradition of applying the doctrine of precedent in, in yes. that way. I mean, I, I think the, the vices of our law today are not so much in the, in the guts of it, not so much in the principles which are on the whole healthy. The vices of our law today are practical ones, money and time. Uh, and um, uh, I worry, it's perhaps not the debate for this evening, I worry very much about the uh, possible effects of um, legal aid cuts and so forth, but then everyone's worried about that. But that may be very important mm -hmm. if, we, if we think of uh, public law, common law, as a system of experimentation. Because mm -hmm. if you can't get before the courts the cases and the advocates who can make the case for the next step, um, we lose an important I, opportunity. I, I, I quite agree. Uh, I'm not sure if I've got anything intelligent to say about that that wouldn't simply be overtly political. Um, I mean, I think there is. The, the, I'll, I'll tell you one anecdote about this, which is. is it's not quite off point, but it's nearly off point, and I'm allowed to be nearly off point. Um, I, I sit in the criminal division of the Court of Appeal, uh, as well as in the uh, civil division and in the divisional court, and too often for comfort in the last, what, couple of years perhaps, I've had cases in, the criminal, in criminal appeals in which there's been a multi-handed case, so several defendants, and they've all been represented by different barristers at the public expense, even though there's been no conflict between the um, defendants in question, maybe a, uh, a sent maybe sentence appeals, maybe conviction appeals. And they've all been merrily given legal aid, um, when in fact, one advocate for all six of them would do. Now, this is a small, narrow, little example. But I, I just wonder whether we shouldn't have done a bit more within the system ourselves to save public money. Certainly that would be an example. But there are real problems about um, the way in which criminal justice is funded now and family justice too, in which I'm no expert. Indeed. Perhaps we can come back to public law then, which mm. is, is, which is just politically, safer politically much safer public law, <laughs> yes. much, much less controversial. Um, I, 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 one of the things that interests me about, about your approach to things is that while you sit in the Court of Appeal, you at the same time say that it's a good thing, I think this is what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, a good thing that the Court of Appeal constrains itself by way of uh, stare decisis, that it, it, it will restrict its own um, its own freedom to experiment. Um, now, I have an impression that you have a deep 
enlightenment or pre-enlightenment commitment to not succumbing to or, or bowing to anyone else's authority. I have, I have a sense that, that, that one of the things that emerges from the Hamlin lectures among other, and my other publications is the idea that one ought not to um, accept simply what someone else has said and use that as the basis for what you feel you have to do. Um, uh, certainly when you discuss um, in, in the lectures, you discuss extremism. Or one of the features of your objection to extremism as you uh, define it is that extremists both regard themselves as bound by authority and think that it, they're justified in, in, in binding other people by the same authority, preventing people from thinking for themselves. Yes. Now that's, that's an important aspect of what you said and what you wrote about the, uh, the, the developmental aspect, the, the experimental aspect of, of the common law. So is, is, is there really a case for certainty as a principle, if certainty requires judges to feel that they're bound by what's gone before, as opposed to using what's gone before as material that can be used for an experiment? Um, let me... I'm not sure there's a single answer to that. Let me start by saying I think one of the great challenges for any person who does his best to think about ethics and how people should behave and how people and how society should be ordered. So personal and political ethics or morals is this dilemma. On the one hand, we should every one of us be thinking for ourselves. On the other hand, no single one of us should assume we get it right all the time. Indeed, maybe not much of the time. So there is a tension in any individual person's intelligent thought about morality between the necessity and the power of deciding for yourself and the necessity to realize that there may be other people wiser than you. And you have to drive away between these two things that allows you to be influenced by the wisdom of other people without being overwhelmed by other people's doctrines. Now that, I think, is reflected in, for what it's worth, I think about the law. I, 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 in any case, if it's in the least complicated or challenging, and of course many cases aren't, because the answer is obvious on the evidence or whatever. In any case, which is complicated or challenging, there tends to be that sort of dilemma, uh, at least if the law is uncertain. Uh, and, and you are looking to see where, you, where the law should go. That's making your own mind up. And you're looking to see what others have told you. That's stare decisis, if you like. And I think that that process reflects um, uh, a civilized moral process. So it's a tension, a dilemma. And it's a dilemma which we should never seek to get rid of. The extremists do it uh, by bowing their heads to a rule, as we've seen recently, sometimes a barbarous rule. But it may not even be a barbarous rule. They just bow their heads to it. I have no time for that. Equally, I have no time for the man who thinks he's always right. Of course not. So the, 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 the reality um, of ethics and the law is to find a way in between. Well, that's an answer, but it's not mine. No, I think it it's is. It's a bit rhetorical, but, I apologize. No, 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 I think it's, it's an answer and, and, and it suggests a further question. As these I things, thought it might. Yeah. As these things <laughs> tend to. Um, it, 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 it occurs to me that, that there are different levels of certainty or different levels at which certainty can operate. One can have 
a uh, degree of confidence in the outcome of a particular case, mm -hmm. a degree of confidence as to what norm will be applied in a particular case and mm -hmm. how it will be applied. Um, a, a, and one can have a degree of certainty about the overarching, um, I was going to say overarching foundations, but that's seriously mixing metaphors, um, <coughs> Uh, of 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 the process by which the appropriate rule is is articulated and, and, and selected, now, it, it it may be or might it be that um, one can have a very high level of certainty about the outcome of individual cases, while having far less certainty about the. Um, way in which we would articulate the norms which yes. would apply to the case and then no certainty at all, indeed open disagreement about the overarching normative uh, justification. Oh, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Was it, that is exactly, well, maybe not exactly, that is quite close to the position that arose in a case I had which um, seems to have interested quite a lot of academics, called Thoburn. Thoburn was a case about um, uh, imperial measures um, and metric martyrs. The, metric, the metric martyrs case. And the reason I mention it is that the outcome in that case was utterly and completely obvious. The argument about implied repeal of, by the Weights and whichever way, by whichever way around it was, the Weights and Measures Act, implied repealing the European Communities Act was silly from start to finish. But I was unable to resist, <laughs> so it's weakness really, um, going into a question which was raised by the excellent counsel for the, the, the prosecuting authority, Eleanor Sharpson, who's now the British Advocate General in Luxembourg, about uh, EU constitutional supremacy. So the case is known because it's because that's what it's about. But actually, that's a deep and some would say difficult issue. But the outcome of the case couldn't be more obvious. And had I had any real discipline in my soul, which I don't, I would have just stuck with that. But a, a good example, because you were saying, was it Mr. Justice Crane? You were he was the, he was the other judge of the and, divisional and, court. Yes, that's and, right. And he He's dead now, alas, I think. Oh. I, I hope I'm is. not mistaking him for somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very nice uh, chap. If you're here... Just... <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. no, he's not. He could well be dead. Uh, but he agreed with you. Yes, he did. And well, it's not that surprising. Well, no, it's not that surprising at all. But, but uh, that does lead into another interesting issue, which isn't strictly speaking or exclusively a public law issue, about what's meant when the judges say they agree with mm -hmm. each other. Um, you know, do they <laughs> actually mean that they agree with every word that's fallen from the other judge, or simply with the outcome that's been achieved? Um, but, you know, it's, it's a very interesting question, because he, presumably he, he wouldn't want to be, or to have been, necessarily uh, tarred with the brush of the speculation which you, you know, or, or was he happy with that? Speculative in the least. <laughs> I think, well, the, the, the whole business of uh, consenting and dissenting judgments is quite important and not only at a technical level. Um, it's, it's some distance from public law, which is much more general, so I won't spend much time. I'll just say this about it. Um, one, of the, one of the potential vices of, our, uh, of the common law system, at least as it's practiced here, is that judges, because we're all prima donnas, um, like to express their own opinions even when it's not entirely necessary to do so. And you do find some judges um, saying, I agree with Lord Justice so-and-so, but wish to add a few words of my own, and then he or she gives completely different reasons for arriving at the same result. Now, what is the poor barrister or solicitor to do advising a client in the next case? He doesn't know what the 
what the ratio of the decision is. But, and I think we have been a bit undisciplined about that. But, but on the other hand, isn't that providing valuable fuel for the um, e e evolutionary it can nature be. of the common law? Because you know, what council in the next case does, and the case after that, is to take the um, various judgments that have been mm. given and construct that interpretation of them separately and together, yes. which will best uh, suit what council wants to achieve. That's right, but, it's a, but, but, but because it's right, it's another example of the need in the, in the common law to measure one value against another. In this case, it's, it's procedural, practical, rather than high principled. Um, certainly, minority judgments can enrich the law and suggest ways forward for the future. But at the same time, they can confuse the result in the individual case. And, and there was, a, there was a, I remember when I was early on at the, at the bar, I did mean, do something about a, a, a tort committed abroad and what the rules were about suing for a foreign tort here. There was a case in the House of Lords with five different judgments, all giving five different reasons. Boys um, and Chaplin. Morris, uh, something in Morris. Boys, boys and Chaplin. Was it Boys and Chaplin? Perhaps it was Boys, it was and, boys Chaplin. and Chaplin. I remember it well. well they, they, I'll, I'll give you an irrelevant anecdote in a minute. Oh, right. Now, that was deeply unhelpful. But at the same time, you can have cases where even if judge number two is going to agree in the result with judge number one, he adds something valuable. But we need to be disciplined about it. And we're not always quite disciplined enough. Where we don't want to go... And which, well, something that would greatly impoverish the common law. It's what they do in the Court of Justice of the European Union at Luxembourg, is not to allow minority opinions at all. Well, that seems, I mean, I, I could not sit in such a court consistently with what I would regard as a judicial duty. Well, it has, it has another unfortunate effect, which is that any paragraph or any bit of reasoning for which they can't get majority support simply disappears and you're left exactly. with a shell with important exactly. bits missing. Exactly. I hope um, they'll change the rule. But uh, if uh, we, we, you know, we, we've got to Luxembourg, and, and that's sort of halfway to Strasbourg, <laughs> except yeah. easy, easier to get to. And I wonder, I wonder, you know, coming back to the point about um, authority and uh, thinking for oneself, I wonder whether your, your, your view of the way in which the courts in this country have approached uh, the, the use of Strasbourg judgments, the, the other principle, mm -hmm. um, whether your take on that is at all influenced by your instinctive feeling that judges should be thinking for themselves and not mm -hmm. simply handing authority to someone else. Well, it, uh, I, I, I wouldn't deny that it's influenced by that, but it's influenced by quite a lot of other things as well. Um, one of my fears about the impact of human rights law is that there will be too many who may think that this is, even now, in, what is it, um, 14, 13 years since the Human Rights Act came into force, there will be too many who think that this is an alien add-on to the common law. The human, the, as, as you all know, the convention uh, coming into force in 1950 was largely the hand of English lawyers from the Home Office. And it's a wonderful text. Uh, and its influence and its effect and its um, uh, virtues have been diminished and I think undermined by two things. Uh, one has been uh, a misreading of the Human Rights Act 1998 so that we have regarded ourselves as close to obliged to follow Strasbourg decisions. And then the critics will say, well, we're just simply being slave to a foreign court. That's one thing. The other thing, and this is all in the lecture, the other thing that has been difficult um, and I think damaging 
is that the judges, some, our own judges, have sometimes been too blithe to make what are really political decisions um, about difficult human rights uh, issues. Uh, and uh, it seems to me it would be a terrible thing if we lost the virtue of the Human Rights Convention by losing public confidence in it. And when I think the there judges, are dangers sorry, of that. When you say the judges, do you mean the judges in Strasbourg or the judges I mean, in this sometimes here, well, I, I, mean, I won't criticise my fellow judges, but there have been Go some on. decisions which... <laughs> Well, I might possibly be. Um, there have been some decisions which I think have um, maybe not quite looked at the larger picture over areas, for example, like the deportation of foreign criminals, where the um, politicians have taken a very clear line. And where and this is the point of principle, I think. Um, the, 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 the Human Rights Convention, marvellous text as it is, is there, as everybody knows, to preserve and protect core values, fundamental values. It came into existence five years after the Second World War and when the Stalin dictatorship w w was at its height. Uh, and it was a response to uh, the, the, the terrors of 20th century dictatorship. It's not about marginal decisions. As to whether this or that person. Uh, can I? Can I? Can I? Can I just <laughs> pause there because marginal decisions. We're talking. Most of the deportation cases involve doing really nasty things to people by way of separating them from their families, mm -hmm. or even more nastily, sending them to places where they're quite likely to to, to be tortured. Or, or um, well, that now is that. A marginal decision is is the fact that the um, Home Secretary really wants to get rid of a certain person, ideally by sending them somewhere where they're going to be tortured, um, a, 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 a reason for the court to say, no, no, that's a we, we won't no. get involved. That's a political issue. I, I, is there, it, is if there I a, give that impression, I should not have done. Article three and Article two, for that matter, of the Convention are. Um, couched in unqualified terms. Yes. If uh, there's a danger that someone will suffer Article 3 ill treatment, he mustn't be sent back. But, and of but, course then, but then the language isn't necessarily conclusive, is it? Because there are other provisions like the right to a fair hearing or some of the sub rights to right to a fair hearing under Article 6. Where, where, where judges have been prepared to allow in a certain amount of, of wiggle room. Well, one of the, well, I don't think there's been any slippage of that sort in relation to Article 3, ill treatment, no. and that's vital, clearly. Um, as regards Article 6, the, the, uh, the jurisprudence, and it's the Strasbourg jurisprudence as well as the English jurisprudence, says if you're going to uh, find a breach of Article 6 by virtue of a state sending a person to another state as opposed to a breach in, in, in his own country, um, then you have, to have, you have to find a flagrant violation. And that's where the law stands. Mm -hmm. I was more concerned in the, what, I, what you might for shorthand call the political rights between Articles 8 mm -hmm. to 12 where in each of those there's a, there's a paragraph two that uh, allows the state to derogate from the right on effectively public interest grounds. And that's where the whole, that's the area which the whole doctrine of proportionality has been developed, we all know. Now I think in those areas, particularly in Article 8 areas, there have been decisions in, 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 in which, uh, uh, where the issue has been one about which reasonable and civilized and humane people might very well disagree mm -hmm. as to what the re result should be. And it, where that is the case, I have some problem in seeing that it's for the court rather than the uh, deciding government to say which reasonable decision should prevail. I think that is, that is a, now, you can take the other view. You can say, no, 
Strasbourg jurisprudence shows that uh, in some of these cases, uh, a merits decision, however robust, will be the right one. Mm -hmm. But I wonder about that as, as a matter of a proper application of convention law in the UK setting. This actually links up quite interestingly with your idea about the way that statute speaks mm -hmm. and your view that statute um, is, once the words are finalised, it's silent and you can't go back and interrogate it. Mm -hmm. So it can work only through the assessment of it, the, the application of it, the interpretation of it by typically judges. Yeah. Um, now, why, is, why, why do you think that um, the, uh, let's say, Article 8.2 of the Convention, which is a piece of, in the international law arena, the equivalent of a statute, why, why is that something where the judges have to say, no, this is for someone else, where one wouldn't as I understand it, one wouldn't be prepared to do that for Article 8.1. Well, um, Article 8.2 and Article 10.2 and 9.2 and the others uh, allow for a judgment to be made that the public interest requires the right to be in, diminished or not given in the particular case. Mm -hmm. I think everyone who's concerned with human rights law would probably agree that the first judgment as to where the public interest lies is for the responsible decision maker and the judges have a secondary role. This is all judge-made stuff, it's, I quite agree, the convention doesn't say this. The judges have a secondary role in effectively policing that decision. There was an expression that's now getting more and more out of favour uh, about judicial deference to the um, uh, political decision maker. And the question is, uh, since we have municipalised the Human Rights Convention and are applying Article 8 ourselves, the question is, how big a discretion do we give, do the judges give to the political decision maker or how small a discretion. It's a question about the balance of power. And this is the, the great and still unresolved challenge that we face uh, in this jurisdiction over the human rights legislation. It is a question of how the balance of power should be resolved between the judiciary and effectively the executive, although sometimes the legislature speaks very loudly on the subject as well. Now, I, I, I think that um, where, whereas the judges have to be absolutely robust in defending fundamental principles, Article 3, if you like, to a, 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 to a large extent also Article 6, although there are qualifications to the right to fair trial. When it comes to the social or political rights where uh, different views might reasonably be held, we need to be probably rather more careful than we have been. Because there's a, there's a, there's a question of uh, democratic power here. Uh, if, if the democratic, if the, if the view of the uh, democratically elected government is that this is the right policy for that sort of case, mm. then uh, it's not for the court that, simply that, to unwrite it. I accept that, but then, um, the idea that, that, that there is a democratically elected executive is a bit of an oversimplification, isn't it? Um, there, I can't remember when there was last a, a government which commanded the uh, support of a majority of the people, who, even those who voted in the general sure. election. Um, we're really talking about a, a secondary form of election of the government where you have the government formed in reflection of the, of the raw numbers of people in the House of Commons. And, it, and, it, uh, and so the, 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 the democratic argument 
depends on the um, accountability, the effective political accountability of the executive to the parliament or to someone, doesn't it, rather than... It, it, I don't think it only depends on that. I think it also depends on where, uh, where you think responsibility should lie for decisions of this kind. Um, I, I agree with what you say about the, the, the nature of the uh, of democratic rule, but um, if you are faced with a question where this person, let's say, has committed a serious crime in the UK, he has also fathered a child by a woman who is a British citizen here, and he's, he's, there's therefore an Article 8 question about his deportation. How is the, how is that issue to be resolved in terms of um, uh, a, a constitutional responsibility for the decision with which we should all feel tranquil? Are the judges simply to say, well, we've heard the evidence, we think it's a very hard case, you should be allowed to stay. What weight should be given to the, in, in the foreign criminal case, the legislative, not just the executive policy, that, um, that such a person should be sent away. Well, I think we need to be quite careful about that. I agree. But where, let me ask the question with another question. Um, uh, how do we prevent that sort of argument coming down to a point where the legal appropriateness of the uh, decision-maker's decision becomes non-justiciable. In other words, what's the benefit in having justiciability of the decision if we're going to say that the, uh -huh. when, when it reaches the court, the court must um, say this is really not but, our... Because the, but I think the answer to that is the court is not only concerned, or should not only be concerned with the outcome, it will also be concerned with the process by which the decision has been reached. And as we know from all the ordinary non-human rights, Wednesbury jurisprudence, um, irrelevant and irrelevant considerations and so forth, unless a proper disciplined approach has been taken to uh, the consideration of the factors that are relevant in the case, a decision may fall to be quashed and another decision taken. But it's not merely that the court is saying, well, well we're going to, we're going to uh, defer to the executive in relation to the outcome. The court is also saying we require uh, a certain quality of decision-making mm -hmm. in relation to issues of this kind, as with any public law issue. I mean, I, I was part of a case in rather a different sphere, which I was in a minority. The other, the other two judges um, uh, went the other way called Sinclair Collis about um, the, the sale of cigarettes with cigarette machines and the proposed ban uh, on this, largely out of concerns for young people smoking. And it seemed to me that the decision-making process that the government had gone through in arriving at the decision to introduce this ban by secondary legislation was not adequate, and I would have crossed the decision. Not because I thought the decision was wrong or bad, but for that reason. Now, you can get the same kind of thing in uh, 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 more patent human rights cases as well. Okay. I'm conscious that no one has been terribly enthusiastic about joining the conversation. So. Uh...